Okay, good morning to everyone joining the BIP Town Hall webinar this morning. BEMA is very happy to bring you this webinar with the baking industry suppliers that serve on the forum. I'm Emily Bowers. I'll be moderating the panel today. Throughout the town hall, you will have the ability to type questions in the chat box that's provided by Zoom. We will do our best to answer those questions while we're on the call. Also, any questions we don't get to during the webinar will be given to the panelists and we will post those on our blog at www.bema.org. When this webinar is over, you will receive a short survey regarding your experience today, and we would ask that you do take a few moments to send us your feedback so we can continue to bring you quality content via webinar. And with that, we will get started with introductions of our panelists and the topics of conversation for today. So panelists, thank you for your time and for joining us today. And if you would, please tell us your name, your company, and one impactful change in your operation that has happened due to COVID-19. How's it going? This is uh, Sergio Caballero with Regional Sales Manager. Um, one of the main things in this whole COVID-19 is the lack of travel, uh, not being able to travel out to see customers, to just week to week hustle and everything that we're doing. I mean. That's the one big thing, being able to get into customers' plants as they're shut down and not allowing us in unless it's service. This is Craig Souser. Um, like a lot of companies that are open, we're fortunate to be in that category. We have um, a lot of people working. Most of the folks are working remote, working from home. Um, they're challenged with that. Um, I've chosen to be here and spend a lot of time on the on the plant floor um, as a commitment to our staff to make sure they're state safe. Um, but it's, it's lonely. We miss them. And um, we're, we're feeling the anxiety from people um, in our communication. So it's been a big change. St. Ange, uh, President General Manager of North America Bakers East uh, with Lollamon. Um, you know, that this, uh, this time of, of, of call it crisis or change, um, I, what, what I find has really been the most impactful is just how the team camaraderie has, has come together with everyone's awareness of the heartbeat of, of the business. And, and um, what we're seeing from all angles of the company is, is everyone pulling their weight, uh, regardless of remote or on site. Uh, really staying focused on what what drives the, the business from from the front lines through the deliveries of uh, the, the drivers. So we're very, very, very thankful for, for that uh, weight of, of the operations. Uh, my name is Jordan Hale, I'm president and CEO of SPF Groups. Um, we've had an impact of the COVID-19 obviously all over um, some of our raw materials. We've had issues, delays, et cetera, um, from different rail yards all over the country uh, because they have lack of staff or uh, influx of uh, demand. So, um, you know, we're very uh, optimistic and uh, keeping our operations running, but we definitely have our challenges just like everybody else. Uh, Mike Laval, I'm a corporate account manager for the Interlox Bakery and Snack Team. Um, boy, from, from a sales aspect, from our part of the operations, I think um, just having to adapt to um, being remote and uh, utilizing technology to, uh, to keep in touch with our customers. Like Sergio said before, uh, the guys out in the field, it's, uh, it's a big change for us not being in front of our customers. So having to adapt to this new um, reality has definitely uh, impacted us. Okay, thank you all for introducing yourselves and again for your time given to Biff. Um, I hear you talking about customers. Um, necessity does breed invention. Uh, what innovative solutions are you using to stay connected to your existing customers and then also to try to forge new customer relationships? For, for my aspect, I think um, for the most part is um, you know, we, we early on, we would did some outreach calls when this started to happen and just trying to listen to what our customers were, were really needing. 
um, and then trying to utilize again technology, social media, um, all the tools that are available, and and even the phone, <laughs> which is uh, you know for us uh, some of us older guys now the the phone is a dying breed. So using the phone again was uh, was a good way to connect with customers. And are you feel, finding that you need to give them a little space or really over communicate and um, be more steadfast? Uh, for us, it was a little different. I think it was just to over communicate to let them know that that we're also operating as well. So sometimes, again, we we forget that we're a, we're a very large manufacturer too. So we have to keep our operations going in order to support all of our uh, our food customers. So um, definitely. Yeah, one of our um, initial uh, reactions to it was to try to touch base with as many of our customers, obviously the active ones, uh, as a priority, just to understand, you know, how this is impacting them. Uh, they have equipment on on order. Do they, is it going to be delayed? Do they need it sooner? Um, and how often they want to hear from us because we do have a number of them that are head down trying to get product out the door. In some cases, with corporate engineers, they've been easier to reach than normal because they're stuck at home and can't be traveling all over the country. But, um, you know, we tried to let the customer set the pace on the amount of interaction we have with them, knowing that a lot of these guys are, are really putting in long hours and extra days. Thank you. Um, all of your companies have many employees, as we know, and um, they're experiencing this as family members and employees. Um, as a company, are you providing enhanced benefits, employee incentives? Um, we've read about some of the companies in the industry changing their pay structure. Um, what have you done to provide support to your employees? We um, initially started the, the first two weeks of all this with a, a premium pay. Uh, I think some people use the term combat pay. Um, and we intend to follow that up with a a more general bonus for the people that you know were needed to come in and, and work at the plant through all this. Um, so certainly, you know, we're we're not looking at anything permanent. We all hope this overall situation isn't permanent, but we are trying to put it in whatever we do financially in the context of um, you know uh, that, that they're doing above and beyond their their normal duties. Yeah, on our side, uh, what we've done is, is really invested in communication abilities and, and getting it closer to the front lines. Uh, we, we've invested in website development. So we have a COVID uh, website uh, access tool that, that anyone in the company can access with all the most recent uh, COVID information, uh, where we publish guidelines. Uh, we, we share, as, as Lalamon is a global company, we, we share amongst countries uh, what learnings have occurred on, on their behalf with, with everyone within. Um, another useful tool that I, I find has, has been very beneficial that I feel coming out of this will, will be kind of the status norm um, is, is connecting daily with the key leaders and, and providing a round table through a virtual connection. I, I think that's really worked well. Um, and, and we can mix it up on a, a daily basis where as, as events develop, um, I, I think really that the communication has, has been strong from, from the beginning and we've tried to use any internal and, and uh, tool that we have uh, at our fingertips. Thank you. Are your employees sharing concerns, um, you know, specific things that they are wanting to see happen in the workplace to provide comfort to them and and how are you able to respond to those concerns so we we've had um, a number of i'll call them town hall meetings with our production staff um, where we've shared some ideas or actually instituted a few things and then asked for their feedback in a couple cases they they really didn't like them and they wanted to do it a different way and most cases we've worked that out with them um, today or every day now they get together <coughs> and determine who's going to be working in what area of the facility so they can try to segregate as much as they can. Um, and, and really, I think the key is engaging them in that dialogue and decision making so that they don't feel we're coming down on them with, you know, new um, draconian principles or policies and um, having to enforce it. And it's, it's worked really well that 
the morale has been much higher having that level of engagement. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, the, the engagement uh, factor, what we did uh, roughly five weeks ago when this all struck was uh, institute wellness checks, uh, uh, where obviously there, there was a touch point with uh, a, a senior leader within the facilities, uh, where uh, we, we would ask the specific questions about the wellness, uh, but, but at the same time, we would ask if there, there were any concerns um, again, that they may have uh, entering the facilities. Um, what we've collected with this is, is definitely a, a higher level of uh, manager engagement at the same time, uh, making sure that we provide any feedback loops uh, if, if do concerns come up. Um, again, that the, the healthy, healthy checks that we have uh, every, every day with our senior leadership and the, the facilities um, also gives a forum for any concerns to be expressed there. Um, I think from, from the over communication and, and the engagement factor, uh, it, it's provided a healthy state of mind for everyone to, to, to bring together uh, th those resources and, and share um, what, what we're doing to protect uh, the people. It sounds like communication is really key um, internally in your operations as well as externally. Um, and we know that technology is being used to communicate with your customers. Um, are you communicating more and are you finding them to be responsive or really um, having a harder time communicating due to the situation? Uh, most of our customers um, are actually reaching out having difficulties finding other uh, supplies, um, product closures, packaging, um, supplies, et cetera, to where um, we've actually networked with our customers to get them in touch with other uh, members, companies, et cetera, to help them fulfill whatever uh, need they need, whether it's uh, in certain cases, ingredients, uh, some cases it was packaging, other cases it was uh, sanitation materials for their uh, employees and staff at their facilities. So almost like they're consulting with us. I wouldn't say that it's more difficult to get in touch with anybody. It's more difficult to probably visit somebody's facility. Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing on our side that we have customers that are, you know, just depending on the industry, some of these industries, they're super busy and they don't have time to take a phone call, return an email, getting text messages late at night, apologizing, you know, and, and this is part of it. Some of it's projects that we're working on and other of it's not. And so it's, you know, they're, again, depending on the industry, they're either overly busy or they're, people aren't just are not running right now. And, you know, it's just, I think everything across the board is, is changing daily as it goes too. So. Hey guys, it's, uh, it's Mike. Um, I'll kind of echo what Sergio said, maybe in a little bit of a different format. Our, our business is a little bit different. So especially on the baking side right now, um, it seems with the increased production, the, the maintenance staff is doing one or two things. They're either sitting in the maintenance room waiting to respond or responding. So we've actually had some at the plant level uh, contacting our plant contacts. And then obviously from a corporate standpoint, uh, it's much different project corporate engineers are in the office they have time they're more accessible and i think we've been able to utilize that time uh, with our resources and maybe instead of just a single call then maybe i grab a couple other resources that are also available so i think that kind of helps uh, strengthen numbers uh, with the show for customers yeah being being a key ingredient to to the bakers uh you know we we, we deliver directly into the the facilities so i, I think that the communication around uh, being agile there, there's been a lot of change in in volume demands over the last past five weeks uh as we all know from the news uh, it, you know there, there was very hornish behaviors uh call it three weeks ago where bakers couldn't keep up with demand. Um, I, I do feel at this point in time that, that we've, we've gotten into, call it a, a couple of weeks of stability, but at the same time, uh, you know, the, the, the communication around being agile has, has been, uh, again, a, a key component 
to, to making sure that we stay in, within the food supply chain and give, give that healthy uh, volume uh, to, to the bakers. So I, I think our communications with what I'm seeing uh, on the customer front has been more uh, volume than, than ever before because you're having to react. To change. I mean, we, we've seen um, examples where we've had to shift loads from one plant to another uh, within hours. Uh, so, so again, this over communication continues to, to be the driver um, of, of this crisis. And, and at the same time, I, I, I like to, to phrase never, never waste a good crisis. Um, I, I think what we're seeing and, and communicating what we're hearing from pockets of customers, uh, trying to help them out as well uh, with, with uh, employment struggles in, in certain areas, just, just you know, stay connected and, and providing any resources if, if possible. So this situation has really um, put a spotlight on, on food manufacturing as an essential service, probably more than we had anticipated. Um, you know, we ask all the time at um, BEMA events and in conversations, what's your biggest need on both the baker and the supplier side? And we hear people um, with the spotlight being uh, really shining on food manufacturing as an essential service. Um, how do you foresee that affecting um, employees coming to the baking industry and also, a secondary question is, in this situation, um, how are you recruiting? Everyone needs people to work. Yeah, I, I think it's a double-edged sword. Um, certainly not, it's not as, I don't think we've seen near the number of incidents in bakery as we have in, say, the meat industry with some of these plants being closed and, and people working, uh, walking off the job or refusing to come back. We have a couple com smaller companies we work with that can't stay open because people just won't commit to coming to work. Um, that said, on the other hand, it does drive home the fact that the food industry in general, baking uh, especially, is a staple. Um, obviously, we can't live without food. And um, job security is high. If you can get a job in the food industry um, and do respectable work, you're, you're going to have employment. Um, and th this is really good evidence of that. I think it reinforces um, our collective essential nature and um, helps make the recruiting easier. We have, as of this morning, just talked to a local college, um, engineering college, that told us they've had a number of seniors seen their um, offers for jobs um, rescinded, and um, they're not in the food industry. So, you know, there's some good messaging that can come out of this. Yeah, and just to backtrack on my, my statement uh, in, in terms of never wasting a good crisis, I think this puts the food supply chain in a, in a very good spot, uh, spotlight. Um, I, I think there's more to come on this um, as well with uh, just retention. Um, I, I think folks are walking out of the building feeling good uh, after they've uh, committed to their shift on a daily basis and, and saying, you know, I, I'm really you know, happy to, to have a job at this point in time because they're seeing within their neighborhoods uh, a big change in, in the un unemployment rates. Uh, th this presents, uh, you know, a, a scenario for folks to, to really see the stability that the food supply chain brings to, to the communities. Okay, we do have a few questions coming in from our attendees that are listening in. So we will start with a few of those right now. Um, what do you think the biggest change will be in our industry coming out of the COVID-19 crisis once we go back to normal? Yeah, so I mean, everybody's using the term new normal. Um, and I think that's pertinent and appropriate. Um, I mean, we, we've told our sales guys that they should probably assume they're going to have limited, if any, access to our customer plants the rest of this year. Um, you know, and that that shocked some of them, but I I don't think it's far off. Um, so it, I think this issue um, it's not going to go away certainly completely until there's a vaccine, and we know that's a long time off. So I think the interaction with our customers, I don't want to say it's forever changed, but it's changed for the foreseeable future. 
Um, I think the level of scrutiny and inspection and you know um, work to get into a facility long term as an employee or as a, a vendor is um, perhaps changed forever. It's not unlike 9-11 and everything that did to transportation. So I, I think some of what we're seeing is, is medium term, some of it's likely longer term. Hey guys, from, my, from our aspect, I think it's automation, right? We, we continue to, to see wherever possible to automate. Uh, and I, I believe that's one of the main reasons why we are in the condition we are as far as the, the food plants in the U.S., because I believe we are way ahead of the game as far as automation. Is there obviously still a lot to go? Sure. But I think um, as, as the goes down, that automation is going to continue to be a hot topic. That was actually one of the very next questions submitted is, do you think this will increase food autom automation in the food industry? Yeah, we, we certainly do. Um, you know, it, the last several years, the issue that we've heard from our customers has been sourcing labor, you know, and that, that might get a bit better for them, um, given that some other industries are, you know, maybe permanently damaged. Um, but that said, um, it, it has also driven home the, the overriding fact that if you don't have the people there on these lines, then you don't have to worry about inspecting them for COVID or whatever other illness. Um, we've had a number of prospects and some customers tell us, man, we wish we'd have kicked that project off sooner. So um, I, yeah, we think it'll have a, it'll become an even bigger driver than it's been. Food safety has been a big driver for automation, but it's going to move into the forefront. Um, a few minutes ago, Craig mentioned that he was um, thinking that teams wouldn't have access to the customers for the rest of this calendar year. Um, what are other thoughts on that? When do you think you'll have cus customer access? I'm going to go golfing this weekend. <laughs> sure. But as far as... Uh, as, as as far as customer access, I think it's going to be a limited access for several months going into the uh, manufacturing facilities. Yeah, I think it's going to be limited for sure. Um, you know, I think if we have active projects going on, and it'll be a little bit easier to go in. I think the days of just dropping in might be done for a little while until, you know, like Craig said, until there's the vaccine and they have the cure around everything. But I mean... I mean, it, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I hope it's not till the end of the calendar year, but, you know, obviously we just have to take each week and each month as it comes at this point. Hey, guys, it's Mike. I'm, I'm, we've already had requests to come back into the plan, so I, I think, like Sergio said, it's definitely the days of stopping in and, and popping in are probably gone. But what I do see is it's going to be, obviously, increased protocol, increased protocol getting in there, right? You're going to have to suit up. You're going to have to have temperature checks and all that. So I think it's going to be a lot of pre-work getting in there, but uh, the plants still need us to come in and service them at some point, right? And I agree with that. Uh, just just knowing how our plants are operating at the moment, and, and there are projects that are still continuing, uh, but but again, the extra protocol that, that uh, some of these contractors have to, to work through. To, to establish uh, the, the wellness of themselves and, and also the uh, PPE expectations are, are different. Um, at, at the same time, uh, this, this dropping in to, to plants, I, I can see that not uh, being the, the new norm. I, I think it's gonna have to be a very scheduled approach. Um, at, at the same time, um, we're, we're looking at ways to, to auto uh, scan for, for temperatures walking into facilities at, at this moment in time. So it doesn't matter who you are, uh, you're going to go through a temp check. Audrey, that leads nicely into a question um, from another attendee asking for the equipment manufacturers. Are you um, using temperature testing for your employees and are you providing the personal protection equipment um, masks, face shields, and are they wearing it properly? The guidelines for some of those protective um, devices um, changed as recently as yesterday from our governor uh, in their office. So, you know, we have provided everybody with face covering, either masks or, or buffs. Um, now we're learning that our buffs, as they're 
packaged may not be sufficient. We may have to double layer them. Um, so, you know, it, it, we're trying to hit a little bit of a moving target with some of that. The temperature test, uh, testing has not been mandated. Um, we've been trying to source handheld um, non-contact thermometers since this started and have had multiple of them uh, orders canceled on us from the supplier. They couldn't get them here. Uh, sadly, they were from China. So, um, you know, we, we do see that coming. And um, Audrey, it's good to know there's some actual automatic uh, testing that could be done. Um, it is an area that we had a lot of feedback about when we told people we were considering testing their temperature every day. They didn't want to hear that. And um, I think now, a couple of weeks later, they'd probably be okay with it. Craig, you mentioned sourcing PPE is, has been a challenge, um, the, the equipment itself and then some of the testing equipment. Um, how are you all handling that? Um, we're networking. Um, we've um, recently been able to source some masks. Our local Staples store um, came up with them. You know, they're not the N95. I don't think they want us using N95 masks, but um, you know, we, we've been able to find everything we've needed to this point other than the thermometers. And we did, we do think we found a source for that this morning, but, um, you know, we're, we're just making a lot of phone calls and networking with our peers to find out if, what, you know, what they have and, um, where they get it and could they loan us some, um, as an aside, we have a, a bacon customer who did post a, a mask that they've developed made out of bacon and we've ordered several hundred of those. I did see that this morning. <laughs> How are you ensuring that um, they wear the PPE properly? Is this been a cause for new training? Um, is there a, a checkpoint part of the, you know, SOPs for the day? Yeah, I know from, from our operations, uh, we, we've asked, and I ask this every day on our check-in call, how many times have you actually walked around the facility to, to do a wellness check? Uh, so, so there's more verifications uh, being done throughout the day by senior leadership. We, we actually um, started with that and we got, again, we got some feedback. They really thought that was a bit over the top on our part. They, they felt like we were the, you know, the PPE Nazis. And um, so we've asked them and they've done a good job of self-policing and holding each other accountable. And um, to the point that I walked in a restroom the other day, I didn't have my buff up and was challenged and immediately <laughs> changed it. So, um, you know, I, I think if we can decentralize that and, and have them take ownership of it, it's, um, it's much, it's embraced much more and it's been, it's really worked well. Okay. Um, following up to one of our earlier questions about um, utilizing technology to communicate with customers. Um, the question is, what tech do you use to service your customers since you can't get in to see them? And have you done remote supported installations? If so, how have those gone? We, we have not done any remote supported installations. We do a lot of remote support. We have um, two technicians in the field right now doing an install. Um, they had to go through, we were so, somewhat happy about it. They had to go through pretty rigorous screening to get in um and and do that install but um i i think remote startup of our equipment would be really challenging we did a remote fat yesterday using facetime and our engineer on the project is hoping it's his last i'm skeptical if it is his last remote fat but um the customer was satisfied you know they're, they're with the machine but um remote startup of something as complicated as our equipment, I think would be um, really difficult. Any other technology that any of the panelists are using? Hey, Emily, it's Mike. Uh, I think we're, we're using a combination of everything. Um, you know, again, from videos to webinars, interactive webinars to, um, you know, all the different platforms out there uh, and, and make it as, as interactive like we were there in the plant. Um, we're set up troubleshooting wise. That's something we've always done remotely, right? We have a technical support group that that's all they do. There are front lines before we send our engineers out in the field. So 
we do have a leg up in, in that sense that we're, we're very familiar with frontline troubleshooting and our teams have been utilizing technology, a simple camera and a video, an Instagram chat, uh, you know, a Facebook, something like that goes a long way. Is anyone using VR, any VR resources? We, we're using AR, augmented reality. We have um, three HoloLenses deployed um, at customers. Uh, it's another area I think I'm actually going to do a blog on it um, probably next week that we do see as a, I'll call it a permanent trend, um, you know, where that technology, again, I don't see it used very effectively for our stuff on a startup, but for, certainly for troubleshooting and training and maintenance, it's a fantastic tool. And we were already down that path anyway, and um, really plan to promote that, that offering because it's a, it's a very, very useful and functional technology. Excellent. Let's talk about um, the actual food manufacturing just a bit. Um, we know that there was supply and demand um, like never before um, for certain products over the last few weeks. Um, do you think that's going to create new trends um, and how will you be able to take advantage of the new trends in food? I, I, I can talk to, to yeast. Uh, everyone knows yeast is, is getting some good spotlights. Um, again, the demand, uh, I've seen numbers and it depends, I, I guess, on how the, the numbers are calculated, but a, a spike increase of 600% from a retail sector on, on yeast demand. Home baking is, is definitely become a, a trend that a, a lot of folks are, are using their creative skill sets uh, for new products <clears throat> within their own homes or are really just starting from, from basics and, and learning about baking. Will this create a new norm? Um, you know, as, as folks re-engage with the workforce, um, there, I would certainly say now that, that there's more bakers in the field um, that, that uh, ha have come out and, and maybe have learned to a new passion or hobby. Uh, I, I think that the, the yeast sales from a retail sector uh, will, will definitely benefit from that. Um, in, in terms of new trends within the industrial bakers, uh, I think what we're going to see is, is a shift as um, restaurants are also getting a lot of spotlight right now on, on how they're going to reopen their, 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 their restaurants and, and what food service is going to look like. Um, it, it's hard to say how, how uh, the, the economy is gonna go back into to gear with um, customers being in a space where they can trust um, walking in and dining in a restaurant. So I think there's gonna be some new changes uh, going forward from a, a food service segment. Um, I think fresh, fresh bread, uh, the retailers can, can talk to those segments, but uh, I, I think that's pretty a steady state. As you think about um, the demand when things return to new normal, um, where do you think the bulk of the workload is going to be? And how are you prioritizing? Well, I think, go ahead, Sergio. Go ahead. I didn't say, I think, I'm a, I think we're gonna see our plant, the plants are gonna be ramping up, continuously ramping up because the plants that had a backlog of, you know, especially the people that are supplying frozen foods, they had a backlog, which they don't have anymore. So I think, you know, going back to the automation, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more companies automating, increasing their line speeds, adding additional lines just to get that backlog back to where it was, you know, because I mean, how many times have you gone in the grocery store and the fr fr frozen section, it's empty. There's no pizzas, there's no, you know, small stuff. So all those people that are making that, they're going to have to ramp that up and in order to get, you know, to fill the to fill that void now. Clearly, we've seen a, a big wave towards retail. I mean, that, that's not news to anybody listening. But um, I think there isn't going to be a comparable wave back to food service. I think it's going to be much more gradual. Um, there will be a shift, um, but it'll it, again, it won't be this incredible surge and. Uh, but what we do hear a number of our customers saying that we're certainly the ones that were sort of, you know, dedicated to food service who are struggling to operate that, you know, they're, they're going to look to 
gained some traction in the retail market. I think the, the, the gains that the groceries have seen won't hold at these percentages, but they'll hold. And the retail se segment is just going to be stronger for a while, um, years. I would, I would guess we're, we're going to lose some restaurants. We're going to have, uh, I think, less food served in, on airplanes and, and other places that are going to impact the, the, you know, the way consumers interact with, with food and, and purchase it and consume it. So um, I, I think food service has taken a somewhat permanent hit. Yeah, I think um, supply is going to be difficult too. You have uh, hundreds of bakeries and around the country and world that have uh, fresh baked products, uh, direct store deliveries, restaurants, um, et cetera, that are more or less shut down. And uh, if they're not shut down, they're 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 barely running. Um, I think. With their supplies, their ingredients, their uh, team staff, um, if, if they're not producing what they were producing two, three months ago to restaurants and direct store deliveries, et cetera, um, you know, they're going to have a void there uh, with supplies, with uh, staffing. It's not like you can send 200 people away, team members, for a month. And then just flip a switch, and they come. They come right back. So I think there's going to be a uh, staffing issue uh, that's going to be very difficult to overcome. But I do think it will be overcome, and I think everybody needs to work and wants to work. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Thank you. A few follow-up questions, um, Audrey. This one was for you. How are you working with customers on actual dough and product testing? Um, so if I understand that, the, so on the technical issues? Yeah, the actual, you know, your technicians that work on the dough, how and how are you working with your customers? Yeah, so the, the engagement is, is really, uh, again, either through video conference or, or some, some sort of uh, phone. Uh, we are not going into facilities right now. Excellent. Okay. Um, this is for all of our panelists. Do you think that capital will still be available for investments um, once the situation starts to change? Or do you think capital expenditures will be frozen for a while? Um, I, I think there's gonna be a dichotomy. You've got you know, the customers that Jordan was just referring to who have been shuttered for weeks and months that are you know, certainly gonna be cash constrained and um, probably have capital plans being cut as we speak. And we have others that, we have some customers that want more automation in our case or need more equipment and they've set um, record profits. Um, and you know, they're, they're gonna be on the other end of it. So I, I think it's gonna be a, a, a mixture. Hey guys, it's Mike. Uh, I, I think um, one good thing out of it that we've noticed from our Shanghai office being the first to go through this is they've weathered the storm and the amount of projects, new projects that came out of this in a short period of time did give us a, some glimmer of hope that once this passes that the, the projects will ramp up and they'll ramp up pretty quick. So hopefully there's a, there's something that, that follows over to us in the U.S. I think it's on yeah. a company. I think it's on a company base. I mean, there's definitely some companies out there that are struggling more than others. Obviously, I think every company out there has definitely had their own challenges. Some, you know, good challenges because they can't get enough uh, products, you know, supply to make their products. And then others, um, they don't have the demand. You know, the cruise industries, the airlines, the restaurants, those are all, you know, uh, dwindling as all of us know. So I think all of the uh, capital expenditures, some new ones will come, some will fade away, but I think once the dust settles months down the road, I'm sure that, uh, you know, those ones that did settle, I'm sure that they will come back. Uh, hopefully this is just a speed bump that everybody learns from and uh, take something away positive. Okay, our next question is from an attendee. 
Um, do you see a trend for prepackaged individually wrapped meals, sandwiches, things like that, versus freshly made at locations like schools and hospitals um, so that the food is easier to serve quickly? Um, and that create more of a need for the USDA approved facilities pre-making meals that include proteins. Can you restate that question, Emily? I would love to. Do you see more of a trend for prepackaged, individually wrapped meals? For example, a prepackaged sandwich versus a freshly made sandwich um, for locations like schools and hospitals um, so that the food is easier to serve quickly, possibly more safe. Um, and that they would, those would need to be um, manufactured at USDA approved facilities, including the protein. We go through um, probably a hundred of those little uncrustables a week. Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, demanding, but my little four year old's demanding. I, I think it's, it, it, it's hard to say um, in, in terms of how the economics play out here in the industry and how people get back into the workforce, uh, prepackaged meals, QSRs, um, grab and go. Uh, will, will that be a um, volume that picks back up um, just due to less people going to a workplace? Um, I, you know, having had some experience in, in those uh, commissary settings, uh, they, they, they require a lot of people to, to assemble um, products. So uh, social distancing and, and some of these are, are, are difficult to maintain. So I, again, I, I think uh, it, it's hard to foresee where, where that industry uh, of prepackaged frozen versus fresh is actually going to take us. I think there's a, there's a lot of change to come out of this. Okay, our attendees are keeping the questions coming, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. Um, our Baker customers are having discussions and concerns as to compensation for workers, and they're having a hard time retaining them. Some are leaving for higher paying jobs. Are your companies supplying higher wages, bonuses, um, and if, if so, are you going to keep those higher wages after the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a two-pronged question and maybe two-pronged answer. The, the part of it is, is it, you know, the element of it that's related to COVID and asking our people to work when there's a, a pandemic in place, um, you know, next to each other. We, we're doing that. We've done it. We're going to do more. Um, but none of those measures are permanent. I think the, the other question relates to just the struggle of the food industry to get and retain workers and, and um, you know, they get pulled out of the food plants to go into a Home Depot for like or more money and that, it can be tough to get them back. Um, so, I mean, I think um, on the other hand, like we said a little bit ago, the, the job security needs to be a really strong message that um, food plants in general are running and um, that's a much better opportunity for security than some of these other jobs would would entail. Yeah and, and if at minimum to just to echo that uh, I think people understand what it takes to, to run um, uh, call it the, the 16 critical infrastructures and food being number two. I think it's, it's brought an awareness to, to the general public. Yep. Um, with that awareness, do you think investors will find that food manufacturing industry is a safer area to invest going forward? Well, some of the, the big grocery chains had, um, had a huge run up the, the first couple of weeks of this. I haven't tracked it recently because it's been sort of hard to follow the stock market of late, but um, you know, I think historically the, the margin return in the food industry generally doesn't attract Wall Street a whole lot, but stability these days um, could change the investor outlook. Okay. A lot of moving parts there for sure. Um, we've seen a lot of really um, positive stories in the news as well and throughout the baking industry. Um, addressing social responsibility, community partnerships, um, and companies supporting each other. 
Um, do your companies have any positive experiences there that have come out of all of this? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, obviously, we, we do not just play in a space of uh, baker's yeast. Uh, we, we play in multiple applications, one of them being distillery. Uh, so in, in terms of the, the news that the distillers are, are getting around sanitizers, converting into, um, we, we've had some great uh, stories come out of those where we, we've helped distillers uh, pull volume from, from them to, to help with the sanitizer supplies. So it's, uh, it's helped kind of strengthen partnerships. Hey guys, it's Mike. Um, real quick, obviously New Orleans is, was hit pretty bad um, with the uh, virus and obviously New Orleans is heavily dependent on the um, tourism and restaurant business. So uh, our leadership team kind of partnered up with the Louisiana Restaurant Association to see if we could help uh, not only find these guys jobs, uh, help support them in the community and so forth. So it's been a, it's been a nice, um, it's been a nice, um, nice ride. Okay. We are going to wrap it up there for now. I think if we've all learned anything over the last few weeks, it's that it's nice to have a few minutes between calls and they seem to start at the top of the hour. Um, again, many thanks to all of our panelists for joining us today and sharing um, your thoughts and your opinions and your experiences. Um, thanks to all of our attendees for joining. Uh, you will get a brief survey when this webinar wraps up and then um, we hope you'll join us again next Thursday when we um, have the opportunity to speak with the bakers that are on the baking industry forum. So from Bema to everyone there, thank you and have a great afternoon. <laughs>